All right, welcome to our module on Passive Recon. So let's talk about Passive Recon. Passive Recon is the first step of any pen test. Now, to the extent that we rely on Passive Recon, that's really dependent on the type of pen test we're doing. But for the most part, uh, you do do and you do end up doing Passive Recon of, of one kind or another, um, even during, you know, like an external pen test where really the goal isn't stealth and you could and even if you're given a lot of the scope up front. But essentially passive recon, the objective is to use OSINT to gather information about the target organization while avoiding direct contact with the organization via its infrastructure. So the idea is to gather as much information you can without actually having to send any interactive traffic to their sites. There's a bit of a gray area here in which if you're, for example, just looking at publicly available websites that they host, of course, you know, just looking at that website in your web browser is going to amount to sending them traffic. But the, the key differentiator there, it's public. That kind of traffic is is normal. It's not going to set off any alarm bells because you're just doing what a normal, a normal internet user would do. You typically perform passive recon prior to active reconnaissance. Sometimes you can kind of stack them, but generally this is something you do first. And there's some pretty good reasons for that. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second when we go into due diligence in pen testing. Um, some sample tools and techniques that we use, search engines, believe it or not, one of the most powerful tools you can use for passive recon is just good old Google. You know, just do a Google search and you'll, you'll see what I mean in, when we talk about Google dorking. Who is queries? A lot of this stuff is just really simple. These are really simple utilities. DNS lookups, nothing fancy. We're just uh, going to the library of the internet and looking for information on our target. So we mentioned OSINT, and one of the most important components of Passive Recon is gathering open source intelligence, or OSINT. What is OSINT? Quite simply, OSINT is information gathered from publicly available sources, most noticeably the internet. In external network penetration tests, we typically concern ourselves with gathering OSINT related, target inf related to the target infrastructure. So when we talk about OSINT, I mean, that's, it, we don't even have to really get too complicated with it. When you go and research something at the library, you're technically gathering OSINT. When you go and extract information about something like that from a newspaper article, that's OSINT. Essentially, you're just going out there into the wild and, and, and looking for information pertaining to what it is that you are investigating. So... Now, th being good at doing that is actually one of your most valuable sp skills as a pen tester, because the more you know about the organization you're, you're, you're targeting, the, the easier a lot of this stuff becomes, particularly when you get into more of the opaque styles of, of security testing, such as red teaming, in which you really may not know a whole lot about the scope up front and may have to develop impact objectives and things of that nature without a whole lot of help. Social engineering, it's not really... I mean, when we talk about doing OSINT for an external pen test, an external network pen test, so we're primarily dealing with infrastructure testing here. We're not doing a whole lot of social engineering. So as such, what we're, the kinds of information that we're looking for really are those that are pertinent to understanding the, the target's infrastructure. We're not typically looking at the human element quite as much for this kind of security testing. Um, notice, notable exceptions for that, we sometimes do look at OSINT data that pertains to things like password guessing, uh, wordless construction. So for example, you know, sometimes traditional wordless when you're trying to crack passwords may fall short in situations where you're dealing with an organization that is deals with a very niche um, profession or something like that, right? Um, so one way to and, and you're not gonna you're not gonna guess those passwords by going and learning their profession. You're spending enough time learning yours. Fortunately, hackers have things like web crawlers and automated scripts that could just go in and let's just go have this script crawl a bunch of articles within like an academic journal pertaining to dentists, let's say, and then just look for unique words that aren't found somewhere else and then use those to compile a word list that you can throw at hashes whenever you need to try to crack them and you could have a little more success that way. Um, same thing with password guessing. You know, there, there might be something, although that's a little harder. 
sometimes pulling OSINT data pertaining to organiz like if pulling org charts, you know, you're trying to find, let's say that this is more of an internal network pen testing thing, right? And we're going to talk about that in, in pen testing 102. But one really useful application of OSINT for that, and this is more of, I guess, the human side of things. It's, well, it's a gray area, right? As we're going to talk about, one of the goals of of once of, of post exploitation is to elevate privileges within the domain before, or or to gain access to things via, um, essentially you you hunt a user who has access to the thing that you'd want to access, and then you go and pwn them. Well, figuring out which user has access to what is really important, and OSINT's a really great way of figuring that out. You know, you could just pull an org chart and go read it and think, or or, or read about the different roles within the company and and figure out that, okay, I'm trying to get access to this server that pertains to stock trading. Okay, so if you hear the stockbrokers and hear the quants within the stockbrokers group, right? So these are the people that I'd want to go after if I wanted to gain access to that. So there's there's a bit of pertinence there. But overall, it's pretty simple. Passive recon, uh, really what, when in, in your typical external network pen test, really what you're doing is you're gathering as much technical data about infra, in scope infrastructure as you can. You know, you can often right up front before you even get into the active vulnerability scanning phases of the pen test, you can sometimes glean information about um, open source information about infrastructure that lets you identify vulnerabilities before you even get into the active testing. So that's pretty cool when that happens. You know, if there's a public facing version number or something or an error page that you can find with Google and it gives you that information, that can give you a pretty good head start in, in racing to the exploitation phase while simultaneously being thorough. Uh, gathering IP addresses and domain names of the target organization's infrastructure, if if they're not, you know, within the predefined engagement scope, um, you are going to talk about how to do that. There's a methodology for that, but I mean, that's gathering IP addresses and enumerating domains. That's something we even do in in engagements where they've explicitly defined the scope, and there's a really good reason for that, and that has to do with the really kind of murky liability aspects, and and, and landmines that you have to watch out for when you are doing prof you know pen testing professionally because usually especially if you're within a third party consultancy you're you're not you're one company is providing pen testing services for other for for another there's some some um, legal landmines and hurdles that you have to really watch out for so let's consider this hypothetical scenario right we have two companies example corp and pen testing company that's actually the name of the company is pen testing company example corp uh, they've hired pen testing company to perform, you guessed it, a penetration test of their forward-facing infrastructure, their external infrastructure. Well, Example Corp is going to provide pen testing company with a list of their in-scope infrastructure. They're going to say, okay, here's our here are the IP addresses and domains, and you know IP ranges, IP blocks that we own and that we want you to test. So they they hand over this this list of information. And, you know, turns out this list of in-scope infrastructure mistakenly contains IP ranges that are owned by a third company, Bystander Corp, who has nothing to do with either pen testing company or example corp. They're just, they got the IP addresses wrong. Someone made a typo. Someone thought that, oh, we used to have stuff hosted over here and now it's hosted over there or Someone just didn't care. I don't, I don't know, it, it, but this, this stuff does happen. So now pen testing company mistake, you know, if they don't, they just take example corpse scope list without a second thought and start the pen testing process and mistakenly finds in the, in, in doing so, they mistakenly find exploit vulnerabilities by, by that affect bystander corpse infrastructures. And this causes a major incident, right? Question is, who is liable? Honestly, I, I really don't know the answer to that. I'm not going to pretend to. Um, I'm going to let the lawyers do the lawyer thing while I do the pen testing thing. But what I do know is that this has now become a very, very messy situation. And it's a very messy situation that likely has some share of responsibility between multiple parties. Um, I don't know, but it's messy. And it, but what I do know is it could have been avoided if pen testing company had practiced due diligence by using OSINT to confirm that the provided scope is correct. And this is this is why even if 
you don't need to do this stuff. You don't need to go find the client's infrastructure because they've just given it to you. You should still go and make sure it's actually their infrastructure. And once you're doing that, OSINT is really the key to that. So what are some techniques for doing this? Well, who is the queries? I mean, who is is a query and response protocol that's been around for decades and it's used for querying databases that store information about the internet res resources that are, you know, the, the, re the registered users and assignees um, of an internet resource. This is like nerd speak for, all right, there's an IP address or autonomous system number or something like that. Some, some entity on the internet, a domain name, who is, lets you look up who owns the resource and how to get in contact with that, with that resource owner. That's it really. There's some, there's some extra info there, but that's, that's really what it does. Um, and as we mentioned, these resources, they're they can be domains, IP address blocks, autonomous systems. There are probably some edge cases there that I'm leaving out. How do we query who is data? Well, actually there are a number of ways to do this. The first is the infamous who is tool. It's a command line utility and you just type in who is, and then you type in the domain or IP address or what have you afterward. And you get a result back that looks like this. Um, access to who is data. This is provided by internet registries and domain name registrars. If you've ever registered a domain, you've probably interacted with the latter, but, um, the way that IP address blocks are allocated is pretty interesting too, but this data actually can be queried, not just by the who is tool, but through the associated websites and APIs of these registrars and registries, which actually sometimes is more useful. It's a little less elite feeling when you go and look something up on, you know, a, a website somewhere, but it actually can be a little more flexible. Um, talk more about this. There's this concept called the, there's, there's a type of organization called a regional internet registry or rear rear. I, I have no idea how that's actually pronounced, but, <laughs> um, rears are organized. I'm just going to go over it with rear cause it, it makes sense. And I don't want to say R I R over and over again, but rears are organizations that manage the allocation and registration of IP addresses and autonomous says, system numbers within a certain part of the world. So essentially there's, I believe, how many are there? I'm actually going to look this up really fast because I'm, I'm curious now. I think there's, I think there's seven. There's five. Okay. Okay. I was close. So there are five of these regional internet registries, right? Um, and they are the African Network Information Center or AFRINIC, American Registry for Internet Numbers or ARIN, the Asia Pacific Network Information Center, APNIC, Latin American or Caribbean Network Information Center, LACNIC, and there's also RIPE NCC, which is, I can't pronounce that because it's in French and I don't want to butcher that, but um, it's the one for Europe. So, and Central Asia and Russia and West Asia. But essentially, all the IP blocks that are allocated within one of these regions will be will be allocated by the regional internet registry, right? However, they're cross-referenced. Their servers are cross-referenced. So you can make a who is query to one. And I think with the command line tool, it's actually the dash R tool that you do this with. But you may use that dash R tool or dash R flag, should I say, and it will actually the, the query, if, if you, if you queried the wrong internet registry, it will actually pass it to the correct one. And most of their, their online search databases will do this. Um, but you can, you can use rear sites to, uh, to, to, to make these kinds of searches essentially, and to, um, and to, and to actually find all the infrastructure, um, you, you can, you can do all kinds of stuff now. I mean, you can, you can search by name organization. You can actually like type in the name of organization for some of these search engines and it will provide a list of IP blocks and you can do it in reverse, which is super useful because the way of doing this by hand is, is, is a little longer, but, um, so an example of, of uh, example, of passive recon methodology, at least for your standard external, um, pen test where you don't really need to do a whole lot of this extra stuff because you have the scope. Uh, would be to start out by using search engine lookups to identify domains that are likely owned by the target organization. 
From there, you'd use DNS queries to extract IP addresses of identified domains. You would then query who is registries to reveal the larger address box, the IP. So you'd use who is essentially on the IP addresses that you've extracted using the, the DNS queries, figure out who owns it, right? Or what larger IP block that the IP is part of, then issue another who is at that IP block, which will then show you the, the who is info for the parent IP block of, of, the, of that IP block. And you just kind of keep zooming out and zooming out until suddenly you're no longer looking at the an IP block owned by the organization that you're targeting. You're looking at an IP block that's owned by the ISP. And that's kind of where you stop. But that gives you, you, you essentially follow those links over and over again for each domain. And, and that gives you the entire um, external attack surface of the organization. So 